Good afternoon, leading women. Good afternoon and welcome to another fantastic webinar brought to you by Jobberman. My name is Sheila OJ and I am going to be the moderator for today's event. Um, today we're going to be talking about professional resilience, building the career that you want. That's professional resilience, building the career that you want. And we're going to have two fantastic women where we're, we will be discussing everything that has to do with career, being a woman in the workplace, and also being resilient as well, and being able to build the career that you want. Um, but first things first, who is Jobberman? Let me tell you all about Jobberman. Jobberman is the number one online recruitment platform in Nigeria with over 2 million candidates on our platform and over 60,000 employers. Our goal is to create job opportunities for young people. Jobberman Youth Engagement, who is the team behind this event, is committed to upskilling 5 million young people and placing 3 million of them in dignified work within the next five years. What we do at Youth Engagement Team, it's basically providing soft skills training for young people within the ages of 18 to 35 through digital channels and offline events. So that's what it is about Jobberman. Later on, I will be talking about different opportunities that um, are on our Jobberman platform. So let's get right into it. What are we going to be doing today? Today, um, we're going to be speaking to um, great minds about the topic. Um, one of our um, guests today is Hilda Krager, who is the CEO of Jobberman. And we will be having um, Nkem Dilim Uwaje Bego, who is the CEO of Future Soft. So, and then finally, we will go on to talk about opportunities that are available on the Jobberman platform. So gather around, get your friends ready, and let's get right into it. Okay, so welcoming um, Hilda, Hilda Krager, a CEO of Jobberman. Hello, Hilda. Okay, and how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good. Can you hear me? There seems to be a small yeah. lag, but I hope I'm clear. Yes, I can hear you now. It's fantastic. Yes, okay. great. Okay, great. And then glad also, welcome. <laughs> glad to have you here. And also welcoming um, Nkem Dilim Uwaje Bego. Hello, Nkem. Good afternoon. Hi, good morning. I can't hear you guys. Oh, okay. Um, I can't hear anything you're saying. <laughs> All right, so we'll just sort that out back end. Um, Hi, Kim, can you hear me? Yes, now. Okay. Okay. I can hear you, Sheila, and I can yeah. hear you in camera. Okay, because we can hear. So while we sort out the while we sort out um the technical issues, um we'll get we'll get right into it. Sorry, and Kim, can you hear us now? Maybe you're mute. There's a. It, it's possible her her, her um, microphone is is on mute. Okay. All right. So she's going to okay, try. Her microphone. Yeah. Okay. We're going to try and disconnect anyway. So, I mean, we can. So, um, Hilda. So, um, as what would you say um, professional resilience is? Um, huh. 
For me, professional resilience is, if I was to sum it up in one sentence, it's not waiting for motivation to be diligent at your work. So whether or not you feel like doing it, you do it because it's the right thing to do and you've got goals to achieve and that's what you're fighting for. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And um, as, as um, so in a way, would you say professional, uh, professional resilience and grit, is it about, is it the same thing or do you think it's, uh, it's different? I think professional resilience is a type of grit. Grit is, is a broader, it's, it's a word that is just, you could be gritty in life, you can be gritty in the kitchen, you can be gritty on the field, you can be gritty at work. <laughs> so professional resilience is definitely a subset of grit. Oh, okay. So how is important, obviously, as you know, CEO of Jobberman and, you know, Jobberman um, right now is the number one um, career platform. Um, besides recruitment, according to career development for a person. Yeah. Um, I would say for me, sorry, I, there's a part I didn't hear before, but I think you're saying, um, do you mind repeating? Like I missed the last maybe 10 seconds what you said. No, no, I said, so how, how does professional resilience um, play a role in our development, in our career development? <clears throat> I'd say just starting from the beginning of your career, right? And probably that might even be the, the place where uh, resilience matters the most because the, the earlier on in your career, the less options you have in terms of the kind of work you can do, the content of that work. Even if you are in a top tier firm, you're still going to be doing grunt work because you're learning, right? And at that, that phase that you really need resilience because fine, maybe you want to be, I do not know, a senior marketeer. You're not going to become a senior marketeer until you've done field marketing. And field marketing is hard and you might hate talking to people and you might hate being out in the sun every day, but you're never going to get to the marketing specialist role you want if you don't go through that field marketing stage. Same with auditing, same with any 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 industry really, right? Grit matters at the most at the beginning because you have to let yourself know that this is not where I want to be forever, but I have to learn. If I want to get somewhere, I have to learn, and this is me learning. So I'll be diligent with what I'm doing right now, despite the fact that I don't like it, because it's a learning process for me, and I'm committed to the learning process. That's probably the most, that's the place where grit, um, professional resilience matters most in your career, because if you're not resilient early in the beginning, you'll inevitably lose your way. Welcome back in camp. Can you hear us now? Yes, loud and clear. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I to know about that. All right, so um, welcome, Inkem. So Inkem, like I said before, Inkem is the CEO of um, FutureSoft um, and also a 2019 Obama leader. Did I get yeah. that right? Yes. That's one of the things I love about um, a lot of women these days. We are leading women just like the group is and we're, you know, um, just doing great things. And so we're really, really honored to have you here in Kem. So Hilda and I already started a discussion just talking about professional resilience before you joined in. Um, I guess I would just throw the question back at you and just say, what, what do you believe professional resilience is? Um, so I think it's really just, I mean, for me, I think resilience is something that you need, especially in a country like Nigeria or on the continent, right? Um, regardless of whether you're a professional or not, um, <laughs> there are just a lot of challenges that you face. I think in um, when it comes to you know sort of professional resilience, it's really about number one, understanding what are sort of the changing things within my time, right? Um, and I come from an industry where everything is constantly changing, right? Which means that you are constantly learning. And, you know, so you have to really position yourself to become a, a knowledge repository that is constantly sort of topping up new knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a real key point of being resilient. I think also being able to focus, right? And understanding this is where I'm going um, and not getting distracted by things that sort of come along the way. Sometimes there are things that look like opportunities, but they're really not, right? Um, and there's a lady who I know, um, Fatimata, and she coined it in such a fantastic way. She said, sometimes we take a snack and cancel our main course, right? Um, and I think that this sort of happens a lot um, when we, um, you know, sort of are not focused on what the bigger picture is, right? And when we don't really have a strategy for our professional development, our career, and where we want to be, you know, um, as as people, right? Um, and also what what drives us. So I think sort of being able to define your values and you know sort of the ethics that go with those values and hanging on to them in a you know 
is, is really key because those things will guide you on your path, right? And allow you to be resilient and allow you to really sort of weather the storms when the storms actually come, right? Because you have that sort of North Star, you have that guiding light, you have that strategy set out and you know when these opportunities that are distractions come that, okay, this is a distraction and this is a real opportunity and you'll be able to sort of differentiate between the two. Um, and I think as the, as the last point, I think it's also figuring out how do you position yourself properly for the next opportunity, right? So this is not just through obviously having the knowledge and doing good work and, and you know, putting in the hours. It's also how do you make sure that you have visibility within your organization? And I think that that's one point that especially women, you know, often really, really, um, you know, forget. And they're like, well, I'm going to be recognized for the good work I do. Honey, sorry, not like that. Um, most of the time, there are other people who do less work but have more visibility and they get recognized and promoted. Um, you know, so I think it's to understand those things, right, and understand how to really position and play that game properly so that you get those opportunities that you're actually looking for. Um, and, you know, just not giving up and, you know, sort of having a, a spirit that isn't easily broken, I guess. Okay, thank you so much for that. Which kind of brings me to the next question, because um, you were just talking about women. Now, I mean, it's, it's common knowledge that, you know, most times women have to work twice as hard to be able to, you know, get promoted or um, get noticed. Um, because of that, do you think resilience comes naturally to women in careers, or is it something that we have to sort of build and sort of um, learn in a way? Um, so I would say I would say that women are naturally resilient because you know from sort of like childhood you get thrown into you know so many different roles already um, and and that doesn't really stop it just the the, the roles just get added on right um, and I think that however there is you know sort of like in the workplace it is a different ball game um, you know especially when you're in a workplace that maybe has a lot of politics that you don't really understand and don't really know how to play. Um, you know, or where it's highly male dominated and, you know, you're sort of the only woman, then it, I think it gets really, really hard and you have to then learn new methods of how to engage and you have to learn those methods of how to really be resilient and understand that a lot of these things that you're experiencing are, you know, only going to make you stronger and actually shape the person that you're becoming as opposed to taking them personally and sort of internalizing them, right? Just looking at them as this is an external factor. And at this point, right? But I'm to make the change because the fact that I'm here as a woman in this male only playing field already means something. Um, and I think that when you have that in mind and you sort of have the girls that are coming behind you in mind, you know, or women, um, you, you then, you know, you, you're able to put on that armor and you know and face whatever fight is coming or it might not even be a fight sometimes you know we we also just imagine some of these things that oh it's going to be so difficult and then by the time we do it we're like oh that was easy um you know so i think it's but but i think you have to build that resilience because it's not something that you sort of you, you don't learn it in school right you don't learn it there's no handbook that you can buy that says how to be resilient in the workplace Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, Hilda, still on like building resilience as a, as a woman. Um, so, Kim just said that um, we need to be able to build it, um, to build that resilience. Um, what do you think are like, you know, visible steps or maybe some steps, if, if, if it's not so visible, that we can take um, to be able to be resilient at the workplace or in our careers? Um, I would say the first thing would be, you know, one, know what you're fighting for. I know Kem touched on earlier about, you know, just having a career plan. A lot of people, a lot of young people in Nigeria don't even get that choice, right? If you think about our education system, th there's no career services being offered at scale. So the first, the first piece of work you need to do is figure out what you want to do with your career, right? And then um, if, you, if you look at the challenges you're facing now, where do you want to go and what do you need to do to get there? And then hammer out a plan. It's going to be super painful. But then if you don't leave your comfort zone, you're not going to know um, how, because if, if you think about resilience, it's like being bendy, but you don't break. Somebody needs to be able to break, bend you and manipulate and you just like power through, just like roll with the punches, right? So you need to figure out um, if, 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 if you then know where you want to go, how difficult it's going to be to get there. Do small experiments that take you 
further and further out of your comfort zone, helping you bend a little more. You're afraid of public speaking? Make a goal. In two months' time, I want to speak in public. It could be at church. It could be at a nursery school. You could <laughs> teach Sunday school. It could be at a family gathering. Do it. It's going to be small, but it will prove to you that guess what? You can do it. So next time you have an opportunity, then you won't be so scared and it'll be bigger and bigger. And the more you, you experiment outside your comfort zone, the more resilience you build. Every time you do something that scares you but doesn't break you, you're stronger. The next time you do something bigger that scares you but doesn't break you. And that's how you keep going. Okay. Thank you so much. Now, with the pandemic and with like um, COVID 19 and everything, so a lot of people have had to face layoffs. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a mental struggle for a lot of them or a lot of people who, who don't have jobs at the moment because it's that whole uncertainty. How can you stay tough? Like, how can you, how can you stay tough through this time, especially with your certainty of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow with your career? And, you know, what would you, in addition to being tough, what would you advise, like, anyone who's in that space to be in? Um, in camp, we can, we can just okay. take that. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, that type of situation is not easy, um, especially when you are, you know, in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of a recession, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sort of like double blows. And I think the main thing is to figure out what next, right? Um, and to also figure out what does it take to get to that what next, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in this asking yourself what next, I think there has to be a very big, like you have to be very open-minded, right? Um, is this job or career path that I'm on going, is it future proof, right? Because the truth is that not just has the world changed, right? In terms of how we interact and engage, but also everything has gone virtual. And because everything has gone virtual, a lot more organizations are looking to automate, are looking to completely digitally transform their organizations, which means that certain jobs will stop existing. So if you were laid off, chances are that your job falls into this category, right? Um, and that, so sometimes not, but, but a, a lot of them would fall into that category, right? That means that you then have to think about <clears throat> if the world is not going to exist in the form that we knew it in January, right? And we will never go back to that form. What does this mean for me, right? And just being uh, accepting that, I think acceptance is really key here accepting that that is where we are and then figuring out okay what else can i do what am i good at you know what are the things that i really love that i actually want to do you know maybe if you weren't in a job that was super fulfilling and you were not really happy this is the time to really figure out what you want to do and then after you figure that out figure out where are the opportunities right and sometimes this means like changing sector or using the knowledge so for example let's say you are um, a lawyer right and you've lost your job looking at, okay, what are the opportunities in technology-driven legal services, right? Is there a way that I can use the knowledge that I have to actually build solutions or help someone who's already building solutions? Because the truth is that technologists cannot build stuff by themselves, right? We need industry experts to build anything. If I say I want to build an insurance platform, I have no clue about insurance, at least not enough to really you know, build a platform. I need someone in insurance that can guide that, right? Um, so it's really, really key to figure out where else can you apply this knowledge that you've already have and what, are, what is the additional knowledge that you require in order to position yourself for those type of positions, right? What type of technology knowledge, for example, do you need to work in a technology startup that focuses on AI in law, for example, right? You probably need to know something about AI, even if it's not like anything deep, but at least the basics. You probably need to know more about the industry, what the trends are, so that you can, you know, sort of prepare for the interview. And then, you know, also just look at what are the opportunities, where which industries are doing well, right? Because there are still industries that are doing well. I mean, like in technology, I've I've not been this busy in the last two years. So, you know, and it, it's translating into clients, it's translating into into you know money, bottom line, right? So at the end of the day, there are opportunities I've hired during this time. Um, and I'm probably going to hire more, right? So it's not like there are no jobs. There are jobs, they're just, it's shifting. So where is it shifting to us? So I think understanding those trends and not wallowing in, oh my God, the world has ended, right? Focus on actions that you can take. Yep. Yeah, 
Yeah, and Matilda. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just add into that. I feel I think what you just nailed in the head. Just add into that and say when you've been let go, you need to have the first thing you need to do before you leave the organization is get as much feedback as possible because there's two scenarios, right? Especially now given coronavirus, the COVID-19 lockdown. There's a world where you are an amazing professional, you are great at your work, but because of the client, the company circumstances, they're gonna have to let you go. In this case, you could get recommendations, you could get, you know, everybody's gonna try and help to place you because it's not it's not you, it's them, the company to survive and unfortunately collateral damage. And that situation is different from if you're being let go, fine, it's a pandemic, but they said, let's let's start with the poorest performers. Let's start with the people who have been slacking for a while. Because in that case, if you get the right feedback, the first conversation you have is, what do I do to make sure that where I'm going, I have fixed the the, the gaps that my employer saw in me and, and thought I was not worth retaining. It's a very important conversation to have. Before you go out looking for your next job, you need to understand very, very clearly what your career portfolio looks like at the moment, for lack of a better word. What do you look like right now? If I was walking into a, into a marketing, um, into an interview, what do I bring to the table? I've been told that A, B, C, D are my gaps. In the meantime, how do I fill them? Is it Coursera? Is it Udemy? Is it a Facebook group that shares this knowledge? Um, that, that's, that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is, oh my goodness, despite all my hard work, I'm still being let go. The conversation there is now, my clients that I've worked with, let me reach out to them and let them know I'm looking. If you've been doing good work, people will be so excited to recommend you or even hire you. Um, network on LinkedIn, make it known what you're doing. Showcase some of your work. Did you work on a project? Do it. Do some volunteer work. I know people, especially lots of software developers, for example, when they're out of jobs and they will do, they'll be part of Facebook coaching and IBM coaching and things like that that keep them busy. Because when you don't have a job, actually, the the thing that kills you, not kills, the thing that demoralizes you the most is not just have, not having a job per se, it's not having anything to do. Mm -hmm. It's extremely depressing. You wake up every day and you're trapped with your thoughts. So if you make that, if you, if you do that um, recon once you've already lost your job, then you know how to occupy your time in the direction of getting a new job. I think that's super, super important. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's just, that's just like, um, that just like kind of covers everything. Um, what I would like to say for people watching, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so that we can, you know, talk about it as well. And then it brings me to another question. So we've been talking about professional resilience. Um, and mm -hmm. some of my I don't really quite get it. And I'm one of those people that say, if you don't know what something is, then you probably know what it isn't. So um, what is this professional resilience for anyone who might be confused? <laughs> <laughs> so, what is that um, about professional resilience? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say, I don't know, maybe maybe you have a dictionary definition for it, but I guess for me, it's, it's what I mentioned earlier, right? The ability to roll with the punch that worked, to be so adaptable that no matter the complexities, no matter the lack of motivation, you can still look at the end goal and power through. Um, if you think about especially women, you're gonna be you're gonna be bombarded by so many things along your career and they're gonna test you. Resilience means that you know you 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 come to every test prepared and you just keep punching. You keep punching <laughs> for, for it's, that's a that's a metaphor by the way. Don't go to places and punch people. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. What well, do you think, Kev? Okay? Because I don't know. I don't know. There's a like there's a textbook. Yeah, I don't know if there is a textbook definition, but I definitely agree. I you know, I, and and I think you know, like what is this goal? You know, and not getting distracted by the little things that sort of come along. Because I find that a lot of people get distracted by, you know, internal politics or this person doesn't like me at work. Who cares, right? Focus. You know, you know what you want to achieve. Don't let anybody pull you back. Don't let anybody hold you back. And, you know, yeah. just keep going, right? Um, and, and, and also understand that progress takes time, right? So it's like, you you decide that you want to lose 10 kg right you it's not going to happen overnight you're not going to wake up tomorrow and be skinny it doesn't work like yeah. that right you yeah. have to work every single day and maybe three months later you achieve this goal right so i think like for me when when i you know always when i look at work i always you know sort of draw the parallels to exercise and the fact that the little things that you do on a daily basis count towards the bigger picture, right? And will deliver the results. You know, and I think that's what we also mean by keep punching, right? It's like keep doing it, keep doing it, and yeah, you will keep see the results that you're that you're looking for um, long term. Yeah, and I also want to add, especially for younger people, right? I, uh, I think I think, and I believe certain personality types 
are just more naturally resilient than others, right? If you think about things like the marshmallow test that have been done, some people can actually hold back. We all know like in, in university, the guys would study till 3 a.m. in the morning, right? They're just pushing. And for some of us, like I, that's not me. Like I, I learned resilience by watching professionals around me build resilience. And I had to have a conversation like, hey, I'm not that person. How do I become that person? Because me, when something small happens, bye, I'm out of here. I, I'm dropping, I'm dropping, I'm dropping this thing. Um, and so if you are the kind of person who is not naturally resilient, don't give up and think that this is never going to be for me you can actually build it it's, it's it's something you can learn yeah i completely agree and i think that you also have to remember that even if you've built resilience for a particular situation there will be more challenging situations where you need more resilience so you're going okay. constantly going to be tested right and and like you said earlier it's sort of like you, you're you're elastic right so it's like you're a bamboo that's swinging in the rain right bamboo doesn't break right and okay. the, and, and that's, I think, what you just have to keep in mind, that no matter how much it stretches you and no matter how much you feel like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. This is the worst thing I've ever been through. In the future, there are more things that are probably worse than that that are coming. Um, exactly. you know? So this is just one step in preparation right, for that next level. You know? And just keeping that in mind, I think, also helps. Okay. So there's a question that someone just asked, which I found which I find funny. Um, and it says, can you talk about the line between being resilient and being a sufferhead? <laughs> okay, guys, just help me define a sufferhead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that. Hello? Oh, I think. She Did we lose Sheila? I think we might have not. Yeah, but, but not to suffer head. I, I think I get it conceptually, but I've actually never heard it defined. Yeah, so I mean, I guess suffer head is when, you know, like it, things are just really, really bad, right? So um, I think the question here is when, how do you know that you are in the right situation and, you know, sort of suffering for a reason and pushing through it for a reason as opposed yeah. to you're just suffering, right? Um, and I, and I, okay. and I and I think that I, I think for me, it's really the comes back to that strat, strategy question, right? Am I aligned with the strategy for my life and for my career goals, right? What is the goal and what are the steps that are taking me there, right? Um, and if that there's no alignment, right? So, for example, if I say, okay, I want to be, um, you know, I want to be CEO of a technology company, right? But every day I go to a construction site and I'm carrying cement, then Really, yeah. and what is how is that helping me, right? So it, that is so far ahead. Yeah, there's no reason for me to be kind, okay. <laughs> right? When I want yeah. to actually be the CEO of a technology company, right? I should probably yeah. go and I should probably go and intern in a technology company. And when I then you know yeah. figure that out, then I can go to the next level and you know sort of get hired and rise up the ranks until I can position myself to be the CEO in the technology company. Yeah. So I think that it's really mm -hmm. about alignment with the sort of the goals that you have that is is super important um when you ask yourself is this a situation where i should be resilient or is this a situation that is just so far ahead yeah i'll say even uh, on top of that right um if you're in an organization especially if you're not there in isolation ideally you've got maybe somebody in hr you've got your supervisor your manager you're speaking to and when you're setting career goals you have these people who you can bring into the situation like hey this year i'm trying to work on xyz and say okay fine if this happens what's the career path in the organization this is what i'm fighting for if at the end of that term the people you then made a contract with tell you, oh, by the way, sorry, so this is what happened, then maybe not in the right environment because you're, the, 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 the people you're working with are actually not, not, not supportive of your growth. That could be a suffered situation. Or you're hustling, 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 and you never get paid month in, month out. And maybe it's not just you, maybe the organization still seems to be doing well, but you're not getting a salary. Or you're actually, um, you're not being given the opportunities you want, which I think is what Nkem spoke about as well, in the sense that I'm trying, guys, I've been, tr I've been proving to you that I'm a great marketing professional, why do you keep pushing me to HR? Mm. Why? And part of it has to be you fight for yourself. If you keep fighting and see so much resistance from the organization, because then it means it's very, very clear they're not taking your career growth as seriously as you take it, you have to realize that you are in charge, not them. So move on. I think resilience sometimes also it means just letting go and knowing even though there's a bit of uncertainty here, I will not stay in my suffered situation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just knowing when to move on. Like when is that point that I should 
you know, and, and at that point, it's not giving up. It's not quitting. It's just getting ready for the next level. Yeah. Okay. Well, my apologies, um, network. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> moving on. So another question says, um, Ms. Kim talked about visibility and the fact that you might not be getting visibility you need despite working hard. How then do you view <laughs> visibility when your work is not noticed? Um, so I think it's really key to, first of all, network within your organization, um, you know, and I, and I think that that's really, really important, right? So that people actually know who you are and ask for opportunities to present things at meetings, for example, where maybe the, the I don't know, GM is there or an ED is there, right? So that they see you and they're like, ah, who is that one? We like how she presented, they know to you, right? So I have a younger, I mean, I think for me, like a lot of the advice that I can give is, is based on sort of what I see as an employer. I can't really give it in terms of um, being an employee, but I have a younger sister and, you know, she um, went through a graduate trainee program in a technology company in the UK and, you know, then, you know, sort of rose to be the head of blockchain for the UK, right? And she did that by, you know, really, really creating a lot of visibility, right? She, you know, she, she knew like, for however, she, she, she's great at networking anyway. And this is her, in fact, her, her superpower, right? I once went to a conference with her and, you know, it was, I was speaking there. She met more people than me. She's like, you need to go and talk to that person. That person does this and this person, I'm like. Oh. <laughs> need 20 people right to be our superpower she uses it everywhere when they have a christmas party if the senior vp of whatever is there she will go and talk to them she will make sure that they remember who she is right she will talk to them about you know sort of ideas that she has for the business she will talk to them about you know how you know ideas that can make the business better things that she's working on as well right she then asks for opportunities of her she will tell her boss i want to present this to leadership give me the chance to present this. I will present it to you first and then you can make sure that it's okay. And then I want to present this to leadership, right? And, you know, because she's also very persistent and pushy. So when they tell her, no, 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 it's not ready or whatever, she's like, okay, no problem. She'll go back. One month later, she's back there again. So I had this other idea and I fleshed it out and I've created a concept and I've done all this work, right? Okay. And when somebody is constantly coming with really well thought through work and presentations and, you know, like, it's not just, oh, I have this idea and you have scribbles on a piece of paper. No, you've presented it in a, the way that the strategic business presentation needs to look like, right? And I mean, she harasses everyone. She'll be like, okay, come on, look at this. She'll harass our other sister, look at this, make sure it's fine, you know, what am I missing, you know? And because of that, the presentations are always top notch. So nobody can argue with it. And when, how, you know, bosses see that, they're like, oh, it will make me look good too. Okay, you go present this, we'll both go and say, this is what we worked on, right? So those type of things create visibility, right? And that is how she would, so she was in the company for six years. So from graduate trainee, she rose to the head of blockchain for the UK, right? And that was a department that didn't even exist. She was the one that created the concept note for that and established that department. And they gave her, you know, she, they gave her a, to, a money to go and do a course at Oxford on blockchain, they, you know, um, gave her money to roll out a blockchain center for that technology company, right? So this all happened through visibility within the organization, you know, and she will always tell you that the key is in networking and actually forming relationships. And she she always says that, look, when, so she worked in sales for a while, right? So all the guys who are in, it was mainly men that were in sales, they would all go drinking. She will go with them. She doesn't really, you know, she's like, okay, well, this is not fun for me, but if I don't go, you know, like the head of sales is there, the VP of sales is there, all of these people are there. You need them to see you and then you need them to be able to engage with them, right? So she says that in these informal settings, you can actually engage much deeper and, you know, sort of build personal connections and that those personal connections are then what you can use to approach again afterwards and say, hey, you know, it was so lovely connecting with you at this Christmas party or at this, you know, um, sales dinner or whatever, or conference or whatever it is that they went to. Um, I just wanted to run this idea by you, right? Um, so that can help with, you know, sort of creating that visibility within the organization. And obviously doing really, really good work, I think, is 
is the main thing. When you do good work and, and clients start saying, ah, you know what, ah, you know, Hilda's work is amazing. Ah, we, no, we want Hilda on this project. People notice, right? Your boss won't be like, ah, why do you want Hilda? What did she do? You're like, no, she's really good and she always takes care of this and she does this and she does that, right? So you notice those type of things as an employer, right? And as a direct manager, you will notice based on feedback that you're getting from external parties as well, who those people are that, and then you automatically start giving them more opportunities because you want them to grow fast, you want them to get you know, to, to the next level so that they can contribute to the organization and your bottom line more, right? So, so it sort of goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. I think one um, thing I'd so add, this is that's I, amazing. One, sorry, one thing I was gonna, I, I would add is that it's very possible, especially if you're very junior, to find opportunities to showcase your leadership skills that are outside your core work. I'll give an example. My first job was at KPMG and um, I just felt like nobody's ever going to notice me in this small place. So I started a newsletter where basically every morning I'll compile the headlines from the top national and international press and send it out to everybody. Within two days, the country manager had come to my desk because like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I don't have to read all the newspapers anymore. Like I just did financial news and the news of the day, everything. And everybody got to know me. It had nothing to do with my job. It had nothing to do with any, with, it's not like a big deal, but it's something that was adding value to people's lives. And um, it gave me visibility. Some people are managing their company's social media accounts. Some people just start LinkedIn profiles that where, they, where they're pretty much being ambassadors for their companies. You can find opportunities to, to get attention from your superiors at work that are outside your actual scope or content of, of your job. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm listening to the both of you and then something that keeps coming up with in addition to networking and visibility is also adding that value as well um and mm -hmm. be able to so you can you can be resilient you can be visible but if you're not adding value <laughs> then you know your visibility might be in vain <laughs> so um i guess the question now would be for um within um how exactly can someone who maybe you you've joined a company you've been in the company for a while and in addition to being able to build your visibility, how exactly do you add value to the company that you're in? Um, so I think the first thing is really understanding what is the strategic vision of the company, right? And I think that that's where a lot of, especially very young and very junior people sort of fail because they're just like, they told me to do this job, so I'm doing this job. But you have no clue what this job actually contributes to the bigger picture, right? So asking those questions of whoever your superior is, right? When you get a chance to chat with the CEO, ask them, you know, or even in the interview, right? What is the vision of this company? Where are you trying to take this company? Where do you see yourself in five years, right? You've asked me as the person who's applying, where do I see myself in five years? Where do you see yourself in five years? Where is this company going, right? And how can I be part of building that, right? Um, and, and you will realize that when you ask those type of questions, and people actually engage because they like the fact that you're thinking. They like the fact that you want to add value, right? And then they will say, oh, well, you know, we want to do this, we want to do that. These are the strategic goals that we have. Um, so maybe, for example, we want to, um, you know, start a, a, a blog or something, right? Um, but, you know, there's no one to really champion this. Opportunity suddenly in front of you, right? So you can then say, oh, actually, I can do this. Then go figure yeah. out how to do it, even if you don't know how to do it, right? Yeah. Figure it out and then go and do it. Um, but I think if you don't understand the strategic vision of the company, it is very, very hard to actually add value because you have no clue where, you know, what is seen as value, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you need to figure out what is seen as value that you can add, right? Um, and then also just seeing, you know, looking at the gaps within the company, right? Stop just focusing on the few things that they gave you to do and actually look at the bigger picture. When there are staff meetings, what are the complaints that sort of come out? What are the, where, where you know, like when, if your boss maybe gets upset sometimes, like what are the things that, that the person is getting upset about that are not being done, right? Mm -hmm. Are there processes that can be enhanced? Are there, you know, sort of things that keep falling through the cracks because it's some, simply not assigned to anyone per, per se, right? Can you add value there? You know, are you really good at graphic design and maybe the social media graphics are not great? Can you say, hey, let me take a stab at it and just do some samples and give to them? There's so many ways of adding value that are small, right? And like here, you know, 
something that I like, thought about it and that added value and gave her that visibility. So it's really about <laughs> what do the people that you work for actually need, right? And this could be your immediate boss, it could be, you know, sort of like the, the bigger leadership um, and CEO or whatever, depending on how big the organization is. Um, you know, but how do you make their life easier? What are the things that they're constantly redoing and doing over again and they're complaining about and they're not happy about, you know, and they're just like, oh God, this thing is just crazy and I'm doing this thing again and sitting so much of my time. Those are the places where you add value, right? Yeah. So I'll give an example. Um, while I was in university, I um, worked as a developer um, in a research institute. Um, and so there are lots of scientists and I was one of the only developers, right? And um, so I was sitting there one day and I was writing code and I was looking at my colleague who was a scientist and she's been sitting in front of this Excel sheet for the last two days and <laughs> you know, going on her screen like this manually. And I'm like, what are you doing? At some point, it was just irritating. <laughs> I'm like, how is my school doing this thing? What is she doing? And she was like, oh, that she's trying to find um, genetic sequences in this data that has come out of you know the lab. And I said, uh, Josepina, go to lunch, send me this file and you know I will sort you out because this is torture. And she was just like, what are you talking about? I said, just send me the file, just send me the file. Tell me what you want me to find in this data, right? Because it was a, a very simple pattern match, right? The base pair is, I don't know, XX557, and I need to find XX557 in this mumble jumble of base pairs that she has given me. Mm -hmm. For a coder, super easy. It took me 15 minutes to write this code. I even made a little thing where she can upload different files, and then it gives her another file out where the sequences are highlighted, right? It wasn't my job at all, right? She, in fact, mm -hmm. she was working on a completely separate project to what I was working on, but I mean, it made her life so much easier. She was so happy and she was just like, oh my God, are you sure this is correct? And I said, yes, 100%. I can tell you this is correct. She's like, I've been here for four days doing this and you did this in 15 minutes, right? So sometimes you have skills that can help people make their lives easier, right? And they just don't know. They're not trained for it, for it, right? So they use whatever ways they know to actually get to the results that they're looking for. So if yeah. you can solve that to them, that is like the height of adding value, I think. Yeah. 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 I'd say one thing I would add to that would be, for me, when I think about adding value, it's a concept of ownership, right? And it touched a lot on what Nkem said, knowing that if this is your responsibility, you are going to execute it until it's done you don't abandon it halfway you don't delegate and run away you can delegate but stay close to the point make sure it gets done and not done in the sense that this i was told to do x but in the sense that this is the best possible solution to the problem we're trying to solve the reason why that for me adds a lot of values because there's two types of value addition right you could bring in you could bring in you could bring in let's say clients or whatever or you could not do something or you could just reduce the cost of management time spent on managing you, of time spent on managing you. If as a manager, I know that when I speak to Sheila to do something, I can go to sleep at night because I know it's going to come back and it will be done. I, I'm the happiest person in the world. Yes. You know what Kim was saying about, oh my goodness, I have to review this thing a hundred times. It's always error. This person never uses spell check. What's happening? That is not adding value. So ownership means that no matter how small it is, you could be the junior intern on a project team with 15 other people, but whatever tiny piece you are given, make sure you own it and close it firmly. Be diligent with it. And when you finally have a question with supervisor, let them also know that this person knows what they're doing and I can trust them. Like real reliability is one of the best ways to add value mm -hmm. in an organization. Yeah, and trust, building that trust, I think is, is really, really trust, exactly. trust yeah. and reliability. Yeah. Okay, so before I even address this question, it's just you're talking about reliability. Now, um, when you're working with teams, like maybe you've, you've identified, you, you understand the strategic vision, you've identified areas that you could add value, but then you have to work with your team. How exactly are you, can you communicate that with your team and still be able to add value and not be seen as this Nigerian oversabi? Because you know how in Nigeria, like you, you sometimes you're, you're like, oh, we really want to do this. And you just feel like you're the only person on your team that understands. Mm -hmm what's going on so how oh do you want to go should i go 
I'd say for the first thing you need to, it depends, what, what's, the size of, what's the size of a challenge, right? Is it a big deal? I know somebody who works in an oil and gas company who was working on something so important that nobody understood in her team that she did learning sessions every Friday for a month to bring them up to speed. Of course, that gives you visibility and helps you learn. That's, that's, that's one way you can think about it. The other way is over communicate. You'll never go wrong. Most teams have stand-ups of good like check-ins. Highlight what you're working on. Guys, this is important for X, Y, Z. Right now, I, am, I have reached here in the situation. I need your input here and there. If you help me with X, this is what we're going to accomplish. Like, really over-communicate. I find that the teams, that's almost always the missing link. Sometimes it's incompetence, yes, but most times it's just not sharing, not highlighting what you're doing, not being collaborative in, in creating the solutions. I mean, if you're part of a team, it's not like you've got everything sitting in your head, right? They could improve your idea. So bring them on board as soon as you can and repeat, repeat, repeat what you need from them, what you're trying to accomplish, what you need to do. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. And, and you know, I think that it's that communication that, you know, Hilda is talking about. I think that's really the key. Um, and I think also sometimes you need people on a team that are uh, over sabi and that will carry it over the finish line. Because if you don't have those type of people, there's no ownership, right? Um, and, and, and I think that that's really important. Sometimes, especially when there's time pressure, especially when you know there's a lot at stake in terms of maybe you can lose a client or something, right? If, if yeah, you are the person exactly. who is going to deliver, deliver. Don't let anybody stop you or think that uh, maybe I should wait for this other person. No, don't wait. Go, keep going, yeah. right? You can go and fix all the damage that you've done by going by yourself later, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, like you're, if, if you have a supervisor, they will see that this is why you did that and why you, you know, sort of took decisions and why you, you know, sort of did work that actually belongs to other people. Um, mm -hmm. And they will, they will, you know, they will probably tell you, okay, but you should have engaged those people, and, and then you can explain that, well, because of the timeline, we would never have delivered because this person was still at the beginning, right? Um, and then, yeah. you know, start figuring out how do we make sure that the other people in the team are able to do their job properly, so that I don't have to carry all the load. Because the truth is that if I have to carry all the load, at some point I'm going to be tired, and at some point I won't be able to run anymore. Right. So it's really important to, you know, watch um, Hilda was saying, like her friend that works in the oil and gas company that created teaching sessions. Right. So I think like proposing those type of things where you can say, OK, you know what, let me share my knowledge. Let me share templates. Let me share the process, how I did this so that it was faster. Because exactly. sometimes, you know, I, I read a quote and it says, you're not paying me for, for doing this job. And it took me to do this job in five minutes. Right? Sometimes experience allows you to do something better and faster than other people, and that is where you need to sort of teach, right? But sometimes in the moment, you yeah. don't have the time or luxury of time to teach. But you then have to figure out how do you teach afterwards, because if not, everything will end, um, you know, start and end with you all the time, which isn't great, and you won't be able to grow the way that you need to grow. So I think it's really important to figure out how do you pass on knowledge, how do you pass on responsibilities. And sometimes what I also find as an employer, what I do sometimes, I'll go and do the work, but I've given it to other people, like, you go do this, take your time, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's you in two weeks. I've submitted it already, um, we've gotten the job, whatever it is, right? Then they bring it back and then I'm like, okay, this is what I submitted and look at yours. Please tell me what the differences are so that they can learn from that, right? And then they were like, oh, okay, I missed this, I didn't do this. Then next time, I'll do the same yeah, thing, go do it again. I'm doing it because I know that if not, it's not probably not going to happen, right, or in time. And then at some point, they get ready for, for doing it by themselves, and they will be able to do it within the time frame and how you want it because they've now learned from what you've shown them, right? So sometimes I think it's just to find the right balance for the right situation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, there's a question here. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. It was just uh, the question says, what is the first thing to do when you're lost in the choice of career or job? Hilda? So when you're lost in the choice, like you're trying to choose a career, it's not a very clear question. Oh, you're trying to choose, you're trying to choose between one career and another or one? It just says when, when, when the first thing to do when you're lost in the choice of career or job to do, yes. Yeah, so is it the I same as is it the next question? How do I move from one career path to another? Knowing my first was in something I 
or is it that you like are it. good at many things and like yeah. <laughs> and so there's so many ways we can actually interpret this question so I maybe know. we can tie that <laughs> My advice, my advice depends on the stage on your career, and I'll I'll use my own career journey as an, as an example, right? If you are considering higher education options, unless you're hundred percent sure on what your calling is, um, pursue degrees that open you up, not close you up. So things like do computer science, do economics, do accounting, do engineering over things like law and medicine and pharmacy where once you commit to that path it's hard to get away from that that's the first mm -hmm. thing i studied law and as soon as i graduated i realized that i made a big mistake and that's fine because then i rebounded so next so, so the, the second part of your career if you've already started sorry my kid just woke up can you hear him <laughs> um so if, if the second part of somebody will get to him, don't worry. The second part is okay, fine. You've, you've, you're a lawyer, but you realize you don't want to be a lawyer. How do you how do you now pivot? What I did was think about careers where they need legal experts, but don't necessarily argue in court. And I started looking for those opportunities. Of course, this could be different different careers. And I ended up at KPMG because KPMG has tax, it has legal, it's advisory, but it's a consulting firm, and you don't have to spend all your days in court. But even when I got there, I realized I wanted to go further. And then my solution at the point was, okay, fine. Given the bounds of my knowledge, I have done the best to transform my career from what could have been a typical law career to something in between. But if I want to make an even bigger jump, I need education. It could be a short course. You could teach yourself. You could do Coursera. I did an MBA because I was at that stage in my life, I wanted to do a second degree anyway. But when I did the MBA again, a course that opens you up. So you can do a business, actually even a business degree is great in undergrad. A course that opens you up because then all of a sudden, I could choose what career I wanted. Like I got like almost a clean slate. I still went back to consulting, so I'm the sucker here, <laughs> but a different type of consulting. I moved from KPMG to McKinsey, learned different things, moved countries, but it's because of the access that education gave me. And it's not always, it doesn't have to be a big degree. It can be something small that's a competence. I think that could also help if you're confused. But then also before you do all these things, be sure about what you want to do. So speak to people in the in the space, um, speak to get, accomplished people, guys just starting out, your peers who might be in a similar situation, your peers who are enjoying the kind of job that you're currently doing right now, because maybe there's something you're doing wrong and you've made some tweaks, you'd love it. Like, get as much advice as you can as possible before you make the decision. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think just understand, number one, that there's a difference between a job and a career. Um, and I think that that's really, really key, right? Um, that's true. You know, and, and understanding that, okay, if if it's a career that I'm, you know, sort of looking at, what is the career path that I need to actually go, right? Because there will be parts that you maybe not enjoy, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to take you to the parts that you are going to really, really enjoy, right? Um, and and I think that when you when you when you sort of feel spoiled for choice, maybe because you're good at everything. So I, I was like that, right? I had straight A's in all subjects, so I. When I was, you know, trying to do my university applications, you know, my mom said, "Oh, what do you want to study?" I said, "Oh, maybe computer science, maybe creative writing." And like, I mean, those two are like different <laughs> parts, right? Um, and my mom goes, yeah. "Um, you're gonna be broke if you're a writer." I was like, "Yeah, okay, then I'll study computer science." That's how easy the choice was, right? Because I was like, "I'm gonna be good at it, no matter what I do," right? It didn't matter at that point. So, and and. Actually, people with this, um, you know, gift, it's a gift and, a, and also a curse because it means that sometimes it really um, takes a long time for you to find that thing that you love, right? Because you're good at everything, yeah. they can give you any job in the organization, right? And that sometimes means that yeah. you become this really, like, generalist that is doing everything, right? Because they know that oh, if we need to organize a party, yeah, let's give it to Ken. Or if we need to, you know, there's a fire in the building, Ken can handle it. If there's, you know, this and that, she can handle it, right? And you become the go-to person for everything. Now, the yeah. beauty of it is that you learn so much, you know, by doing all these different things. But it also means that you have those distractions yeah. that pull you off a path that other people who just know, I can't do accounting and I can't do account, I can't do anything else, right? that person will progress yeah. in accounting and just be going, 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 right? Um, while you yeah. learned a little bit of hospitality, then you learned a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, you know, so, so be careful, you know, in, in that. Sometimes, you know, being multifaceted is, is, is not easy because it 
um, you know, sort of, sort of makes it hard, right? Um, and, you know, up till today, I have, you know, sort of peers in the industry that tell me, like, you can, you're doing too many things and, you know, like, focus on one. And I'm like, you know what? I've realized that I need these multiple things. So apart from my technology company, I have a company that produces baby products, right? Um, so completely different. In that company, I just do the creative design because that helps me sort of with my creative side. Um, you know, but I can only do that because I am the owner of the company and I founded it and I decided, okay, that's what I want to do, right? Um, when you're in a job or, you know, you're building a career, sometimes you don't have the luxury to actually do those type of like complete switches, you know, because that also looks weird on a CV. If you come to me yesterday, you are an event planner. Today, you are a digital marketer. And then tomorrow you want to be a fireman. You know, I will be very confused about, and, and there are many people like that. I've seen so many CVs like that where it's so random and there's no, you know, sort of thread that sort of tells me where you want to even go. And I wouldn't hire a person like that simply because you seem confused, right? You may not be, you may be doing these things for a reason, but if you can't explain it to me and it doesn't make sense to me and it doesn't fit into my bigger picture for my organization, um, you know, then I probably won't hire you. So be careful with sort of being pulled between different, you know, sort of, um, you know, especially between different jobs. If you're on a career path, follow that career path and figure out, you know, what are the steps that you need to take to get to the next level. Thank you so much. I think Hilda got disconnected next work, so she'll she'll be back. Um, so yeah, there is back. <laughs> there's a question here, um, which basically just talks about you know because we've been talking about resilience, and, um, and so this question is basically asking um, you know as she says that they learn from observation. So their question, oh Hilda is back, yay! Hi guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, so this is basically the last question for the both of you. And it's just saying with being resilient, can you give examples from your career path where you've had to be resilient or where you've had to, um, well, because the way, the way the question is phrased in, and I should just say is that what has been your greatest failure and how were you able to power through, you know, in, with, with career or, and with being resilient? So whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I always find I can go first. hard. Me too, but I because I, I, I don't think about the things that I've gone through in my career as failures. Like I yes, literally cannot. Too. Oh my god. I struggle with I can talk about challenges though. I can talk about challenges, yeah. but not failures, right? I think maybe my biggest challenge was being um, I guess pregnant and then having a baby as a consultant with lots of travel and lots of long hours. And just it was, as a first time mom, first of all, when I was pregnant, I was actually working in Qatar, um, like, you know, in the summer, probably in, in Ramadan. So it was not easy, but that's fine. I, I think I part through that. After I had my child, my everything about me changed. My body changed, my mind changed, the way I was thinking changed, my priorities changed, but I was still at this job, which I'd taken as a single girl that liked to be on planes. Um, and, and, and the two things that I was considering, one was, this is not my call, my life's calling. I know that for a fact. This was a generalist role to help me explore what I wanted to do. But I'm here now. I need to still do well. I will not be fired from this job. I will not be let go due to poor performance. <laughs> but I also need to reprioritize my life. At what point do I see my child? What kind of mother do I want to be? What kind of parent do I want to be? And how do I accommodate that? Um, and I think I powered through this job for maybe, let's say, five months of literally waking up every day and saying, I only have strength to work today because I am trying to live as a great professional. I'm trying to think through my next opportunities. I'm trying to be a mom to a sleepless kid, but I'm going to hustle through. And then in five months, I had a frank conversation to say, you know what, this is not the job for me. And I have to leave this job, even though I have no job right now. But if I stay here, I'm going to erode my credibility. I'm going to end up being depressed and I'm still not seeing my kid. And so I left and for six months, I was literally, you know, just probably self-employed, trying to figure out what next. That's before I joined Job Man. This is a very recent story, by the way, right before I joined Job Man. Yeah. And for me, resilience in that moment was, <laughs> resilience in that moment was two things. One, knowing that even though right now I do not like this job, I need to still deliver for my clients, mm -hmm. for my managers, as a manager of software, for my partners, for my team, the people I'm coaching and who are looking up to me, I need to deliver. That's the first thing, because as a professional, you are only as good as your last referral. You know, if you go somewhere and trust your name, it's going to be harder, to, much, much harder to build than if you didn't. And then after I made the decision to leave to say this is going to be hard, I might not have an income for a while. I might not 
find the dream job I want tomorrow, but I need to just build power through and know that eventually I'm going to land in the right place and it'll be better for my family, better for myself and my professional growth as well. And, and it worked yeah. out well because I'm here today. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I think for me as well, you know, I, I don't see, like, I don't see things, I, I don't classify it as failures, right? So to me, um, you know, they may, those things are challenges and they may seem big at the time, but the minute you're through it, it's sort of like, oh yeah, okay, well, that's done. Um, so, so it's really hard to sort of recall specific um, moments especially because I think the path of entrepreneurship, which I've been on for 12 years, is, you know, simply a path of resilience, right? Um, especially yep. because I started a technology company when there was hardly a tech ecosystem, right? A lot of people thought that, you know, she's crazy. Why is she doing this? Like, what is technology, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we used to build, um, you know, at, when I started, it was a web development agency, um, and we used to do web development at hosting, and, um, and, you know, I would go to meetings and, you know, like I would hear things like, young girl, I've been making money before you were born. What is this website going to do for me? Right? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the market simply wasn't ready, right? Um, and, and we had to, con like, I had to figure out, like, okay, how do I convince people, right? And I then realized that, okay, part of that is educate because I, at some point I got frustrated. I'm like, okay, I've done samples for you so you can see how it's going to look. I've, you know, created the sitemap. I've pretty much done the entire project apart from the, <laughs> putting it online, right? So you can see everything yeah. before even trying to get the job. And so it was extremely frustrating, but the markets, like in hindsight, I know that the market simply wasn't ready, right? I know that um, I was part of the people who pioneered, you know, sort of like that getting businesses online and that, that that's an important role. But when you're going through it, it's just like, what, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Um, is yeah. this is this the right path? You know, so there was a lot of question marks, and you know, then I, you know, like also people didn't understand the whole why is she working from home? Like, what? Who does that? All of us now, yeah. but I mean, I it was like a, a crazy concept, you know. Um, and and people didn't understand why don't you have an office? You know, even like my parents, like. My mom would call me, you know, in the middle of a work day and be like, oh, can you cook this and can you wash the, the, the clothes? And I'm like, yeah. I'm working. And then, you know, she was like, but you're at home. And I'm like, I, I, yeah, I'm working. I said, will you call your daughter that's in the bank? She said, no, she's in the bank. She's working. I'm like, right. You know, so, yeah. so it, just, it just, you know, like there were different types of challenges that just made it really, really hard to, you know, and then obviously, you, you you know, I mean, I started my business, I was 25. I, I didn't really know where it was going and what would happen, whether it would be successful or not. I just felt like if I don't do this now, I'll probably never have the chance to, um, you know, live this type of carefree, no matter what happens, life um, again, right? Um, and, and one of the reasons why I started my business was because I wanted to be able to be you know, the, the mom that can go to every recital, even if it's at eight o'clock in the morning or at 12 noon or at 4 p.m. because I own my own time. And, you know, entrepreneurship was the only way to do that, at least in my mind. Um, you know, and and that journey, you know, up till today is still a journey that, you know, has a lot of sort of ups and downs. And when you speak to, you know, other entrepreneurs, you, you know, and you hear their stories, there's always that, you know, there are always so many challenges. Um, you know, where you're either worrying about payroll or you're worrying about completing a project or how do you get new clients or are you, do you need to, like now with this pandemic, are you supposed to pivot? Are you not supposed to pivot? What are you supposed to do to, you know, stay alive? How do you keep your team together even though now everything is virtual? So as I said earlier, you know, these challenges will keep coming. They will keep getting bigger, right? The, the, the more you grow, the bigger um, the challenges become. And that's fine, you know, I think it's really taking it one stride at a time and understanding that these challenges are part of your journey and they're only going to make you better and bigger. And also understanding that there are people with even bigger challenges, right? So one of my clients, um, you know, he said to me, he said, I said, wow, you know, you're doing all this like amazing work and you know, like have you, your business is so big. And he said, he said, you know, it's not always a good thing. I said, why? I was like, yeah, 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 and he goes, yeah, I need like a million dollars to fix my own problems. He's like, do you want to still be in my shoes? 
And I was like, mm, yeah, maybe not right now. Right? Um, so, so, so I think that just puts it into perspective, right? The further you go in building a business or building your career, the bigger those challenges will will become, and that's just life, you know. So, not seeing it as failures, I think, is is you know, for me, the the best strategy because then everything just becomes a learning curve, and everything just becomes this thing that is like, okay, what is this thing going to do for me? I want to see how I look afterwards, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's so well Thank said. So yeah, it's very well said. Um, just thank you so, so much for actually being part of this live session today. I have learned so much. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about this, we talked about networking, we talked about adding value. It's just, it's just so much. So what I would just say is like any final words for the ladies who are watching at the moment, like just any final words in terms of um, being resilient in career development and um, in Kenya, we can start with you. Okay, I think keep pushing, um, don't get distracted and just, you know, focus. And and I think the most important thing is have a strategy for your life, right? Figure out, this is where I want to be in 10 years and then have a plan and write it down, right? Um, you will see that it then becomes much clearer what the actual action steps are that you need to take and then put timelines to those and start taking those steps, right? Things don't happen by chance. You work for them and you position for them and you 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 know you sort of and, and also don't be afraid of talking about the things that you want to do, right? Yeah. Um, you know, say to people, I want to sit on a board, I want to do XYZ, I want to do this and this, right? Because if they don't know, they cannot recommend you, right? And I think that is part of you know that network that you have to not only grow, but also nurture, right? Nurture your network and, and figure out how you can use that network because every single problem you have, there's one person in that network that at least knows somebody else that can fix that problem. And that's the truth of it, right? And everybody has that in their own, in their own network, someone who can help them fix a problem. But if you don't nurture those relationships, you will never get to the point where you can actually fix the problem. So I think it's really, really key to to keep those relationships alive, um, especially with, you know, sort of like former colleagues, um, you know, clients like Hilda mentioned, um, you know, and, and just people that you've worked with over the, the years, your former bosses, all of those people, you know, especially if you've done good job, a good job and you've added value, you know, they will help you with new things that are coming along or recommend you for positions you know um so yeah so i think be visible put it out there what you want have a plan follow the plan execute 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 every single day and you'll you'll be fine you'll get there yeah awesome i think for, yeah for me it would be that so resilience doesn't mean that you're always pushing right resilience doesn't mean that everything always goes perfect because you're working so hard and so the, the world the stars must align resilience means you always bounce back there'll be times when you try your best and it's still not good enough. In that which case, you learn and you bounce back. There'll be times when you're just honestly tired and you can't possibly, you know, do this, carry this burden one more day. And it's fine to put it down and take a break and be on leave, but then you bounce back. They'll, they'll, I think that's the element that you need to realize that there's no such thing. And I know somebody says you always connect with dots backwards, super cliche, but when you look back, you're like, ah, actually, I was able to do this project later on in life because of that big challenge I faced five years ago, right? you bounced back and every time you bounce back you learn skills you probably connect with new people you build a network and the more you bounce back it's, it's, it's you're creating you're building an objective database for yourself that you can always tell you that you can always use to um to combat the negative voices in your head that are telling you can't do it or you should give up you're like no i didn't give up when i was almost dying at this stage why should i give up now right if you didn't give up if you can didn't give up when she was looking for payroll why would she give up now you know the more objective evidence you have of doing things of overcoming challenges the easier it is for you to look at a very difficult problem and say, okay, you know what? I am here for it. I'm not going to give up. I can pour through it. I have done it before. I've got evidence. So whatever whatever voice in my head is telling me I can't do it, mm -hmm. you need to sit because I know I can. And that's how you keep building it. Thank you so, so much. Just have a strategy. Can I just add life. one thing? Can I just add one thing? <laughs> in terms of those like, positive affirmations, right? Also, yeah. Have accountability buddies. Surround yourself with people that will remind you. A lot of the time when I'm like, exactly. oh my God, like I can't do it. My sisters are like, uh, do you remember that time that you did this? Do you remember this thing? Do you remember that thing? I'm like, oh yeah, oh, okay. And then like you go out of it and you're like, yeah, 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 okay, I can do this, right? So sometimes again, 
exactly sometimes you need other people you know so you need to share your accomplishments and, and the things that you've gone through with people so that they can also remind you i think that's just what i wanted to add yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you Great. so 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 much it's been thank so brilliant um so we we'll hope to have you again sometime soon in camp and of course Hilda. <laughs> so, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. And nice thank you so much. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so um again, my colleagues are in the comments section. So if you have any comments or anything, please feel free to um leave your comments in the comment section. Um also Today, we've talked about adding value, we've talked about networking, we've talked about looking um, for opportunities. And obviously, this is where Jobber Man comes into play as well. Where are you um, in your career right now? Have you built a strategy for your life? And if you feel like you're not on that strategy, what opportunities are out there for you? So you should sign up on Jobber Man. Um, the link is right there on the screen. It's jobberman.com forward slash customer and for slash sign up. And when you sign up on Jobberman website, you also get to see a lot of job opportunities that are out there for you. Some of the current job vacancies that we have at the moment is uh, with Cornerstone Insurance. Um, so if you go, um, Cornerstone Insurance is looking for virtual agents. So just go on jobberman.com and then you can get to know more about that. We also have job opportunities with in the agricultural um, sector with a company called Tribe at Greek. They are looking for field agents. So again, feel free. And um, another one, which I find very interesting, is it Novatia Translations Limited. They are looking for translators, language translators around Nigeria for different languages, some Nigerian languages, and as well as some international languages. So if that has that, that has been something that you've always been interested in and you're looking at job opportunities or opportunities to grow in that sector, then please go on jobberman.com and get more details. And finally, Verify Me is looking for verification agents around Nigeria. Again, so just go on jobberman.com, look for the jobs with Cornerstone Insurance, Tribe by Greek, Novatia Translations, as well as Verify Me. You can always reach out to us and talk to us. Um, our website is jobberman.com forward slash you hyphen engagement. Our email address is youthengagement at jobberman.com. Our LinkedIn, Jobberman Youth Engagement. Um, our Twitter, jobberman.com. And then Instagram and Facebook is Jobberman Nigeria. Finally, if you are part of this leading woman group and you enjoyed the session today, don't be shy. Invite your friends, your female friends in career and they're building their careers to join the leading women group because we're going to keep having power packed sessions like this. And that would be it for us today. My name is Sheila OJ and my, my, um, my colleagues are in the comments section responding to all your questions. And um, I, look, I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you very much and have a good day.